Greetings, everyone. Um, good evening, and, and, and welcome to the Archaeology Cafe. Uh, I am pleased to be your host tonight. Uh, for those of you who I haven't met yet, my name is Sarah Anderson, and I am the Director of Outreach here at Archaeology Southwest. Tonight is the second talk of the 2023-2024 season of the Archaeology Cafe. Uh, this program, and especially this season, could just as easily be called Preservation Archaeology Cafe. Preservation Archaeology is at the heart of our mission and practice, but exactly what does that mean? In our view, it's a holistic and conservation-based approach to exploring and protecting heritage places while honoring their diverse values. Our vision is that heritage places, ancestral landscapes, and associated knowledge and values are stewarded and protected respected and celebrated across the US and the world. To do this work, we compile archeological information, make it accessible and understandable and share it with the public and decision makers like you. We advocate for landscape scale protection, steward heritage properties and conservation easements, and we are committed to real and ongoing collaboration with indigenous communities. The cafe uh, season, this cafe season is entitled Nourishing Body, Soul, and Earth, Traditional Foods and Foodways. It's a fascinating exploration of how food has shaped and continues to shape our cultures and societies. But before we dive into tonight's program, let's take a moment to acknowledge and honor the land on which we gather. We recognize that here in Tucson, we are on the homelands of the Tohono O'odham and the lands of the Pascuyaki tribe. And we encourage that all of you take a moment to reflect on whose lands you are on tonight. Now, I'd like to welcome tonight's presenter, Dr. Elizabeth Lauterbach. She is an Associate professor, professor of Anthropology at the University of Utah and the Curator of Archaeology at the Natural History Museum of Utah. Her presentation tonight is entitled Ancient Domestication of the Four Corners Potato, Archaeology, Sex, and Genetics. I'll ask Dr. Lauterbach to turn on her camera and join us. And I want to thank all of you for being here tonight. We hope that you are as excited as we are to hear from Dr. Lauterbach and sit back, relax, and enjoy. Thank you all. Take it away. Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, my talk tonight is on the ancient domestication of the Four Corners potato, archaeology, sex, and genetics. And the process of domestication results in foods that are nutritious and can be grown, harvested, and stored and eaten. It's an interactive process with humans transporting and cultivating desirable species, thus creating a great diversity of plant forms. As many of you know, the current paradigm for agricultural origins in the Four Corners region, perhaps uh, beginning in the late Holocene, is that people adopted exogenous domesticates, such as maize, beans, and squash, instead of manipulating native plant populations. However, hunter-gatherers routinely traded and transported high-value plant foods and other items across long distances throughout the Holocene. Um, a lot of different foodstuffs, including moose, there's salt, obsidian, pottery, theobromine, or cacao, or chocolate. Um, even feathers of scarlet macaws were found in rooms of Pueblo Benito. And the tubers of Solanum jamesii may have been one of these foods that, um, because they're they're very small and relatively easy to carry, and they provide starch and other valuable nutrients to the carriers. So Solanum jamesii is a tuber-forming diploid species that's widely distributed with a documented range from southern Utah into Texas, and this area is known as the Four Corners region. Each one of those circles is a potato population that's been documented in the past or that our team has documented during this project. Now there's two other tuber forming species that occur in Western North America, and that's Selenum stoliniferum um, and Selenum cardiophyllum. And, but Selenum jamesii is the northernmost tuberine Selenum. 
So why would have why would have people in the past focus on Slanum jamesii out of the native flora? Well, the tubers might have been an important food source because of their nutritional qualities, their reliable productivity, their availability in winter and spring months when other food sources were not available, their ability to persist um, in the soil, and the glyco glycoalkaloids, that's those bitter components that occur in most of um, potato family, nightshade family, um, those bitter uh, components deter herbivores and therefore there's no animal dispersal or of the tubers or the fruits. And so there's no competition um, with animals either. Um, we've uh, had quite an uh, extensive outreach program with this project. Um, tonight, I'm not gonna dwell too much on that. I'm gonna talk more about the genetics and um, some of the mating experiments and the archaeology we've done. But just to tell you, we've served the potato at several indigenous dinners. Um, it's delicious. It's really earthy and nutty flavor. Um, we've also done a complete nutritional array on this potato. And it turns out that it's um, better than the organic red potato. It's got three times the protein, almost twice the dietary fiber, lots more minerals than the uh, red potato. Um, some of the drawbacks is that it has more sugars and more calories, um, and, but that's probably because it's um, smaller and more compact with starch. Um, but in the past, more calories and sugars might've been a good thing. The cultural uses and the spiritual value of the potatoes is also really important. The memories of the Diné or Navajo and the Hopi Pueblo elders across the Four Corners region record their traditional ecological knowledge and wisdom of the potato. And the name uh, for the potato in Diné is Namasi Yasi, and in Hopi it's Tumna. And here you see uh, the tubers in a Navajo wedding basket. And then my co-author, Cynthia Wilson, these are her cousins, Usa and Usano, who are harvesting the tubers from a potted potato plant. The elders that we interviewed reveal it to be an ancient food and a lifeway medicine once collected from the wild and grown in now faded gardens, diminished over the last century by drought and displaced by potatoes from elsewhere. And one of our uh, indigenous partners was Arnold Clifford, a well-known Diné botanist. And he's holding my son here who has the nickname Namashi Yuski, little potato boy. Uh, our work with the potato has um, uh, received uh, local and national press. And um, and again, our, our work with the indigenous groups is quite extensive. Even our own um, uh, Secretary of the Interior has tasted the potatoes. So hopefully it's becoming well known. So in addition to all these valuable and desirable traits that I've just mentioned, populations of this species now occupy atypical habitats among and within the great pueblos of the Southwest. And this again is evidence that indigenous farming practices included the species. Um, a well-known ethnobotanist, Richard Yarnell, wrote in an important 1965 publication that this potato was found at Chaco Canyon in a mortuary bowl interred in Pueblo Benito ruin where it still grows. And sure enough, populations of the potato still grow in Chaco Canyon. Um, so we're not the first ones to note this association with archeological sites. In 2019, we found a new population of the potato is found high above a two-story dwelling and um, in a pool of sand. And that's kind of what these two boxes are showing. The upper box is the uh, two-story dwelling and then the lower box is showing the pool of sand where um, uh, the potato is growing and in, in at the base of this slick rock waterfall. So again, a very atypical habitat, not a natural, um, place where the potato would be growing. So we assembled a team of uh, interdisciplinary scientists, um, which included an archaeologist, myself, 
a geneticist, Alfonso Del Rio, an agronomist, John Bamberg, um, a plant ecologist, Bruce Pavlik, a nutritionist, Cynthia Wilson, as well as a phytochemist, David Kinder. And we've done over 10 years of field surveys for the potato. We've documented the dynamics of the potato populations and which ones were associated with archaeology. And with funding from the National Science Foundation, this led us to then test the overarching hypothesis that two birds of a native potato were transported, processed, and manipulated sometime during the Holocene in the American Southwest. And um, today we'll be talking about the starch residue and genetic data. And I'm also gonna be talking a little bit about some of the mating experiments that Bruce did in the greenhouse. So in our project, assessing domestication involves three lines of evidence. Use is documented by examining the starch residues on dated groundstone tools, as well as intergenerational practices arising from tribal elder interviews. Um, these were done by Cynthia. Transport is inferred from the anomalous patterns of allelic variation and demographic characteristics among plant populations associated with archeological sites and traditional lands, especially when compared to non-archeological populations near the center of the species range. And manipulation would man itself in, itself in reduced levels of glycoalkaloids, inedible parts, the occurrence of unique genetic markers, as well as enhanced productivity under cultivation. And detecting these stages would challenge a long established scientific paradigm regarding agricultural origins and food choices among hunter gatherers in North America by identifying the four corners as a hitherto unknown center of plant domestication. So again, I'm really just going to be talking about the starch granule data and the genetic data. So for the starch granule data, what we did is we um, looked at ground stone tools. These are monos and metades um, from 13 different archeological sites. Six of these are beyond the range. So you can kind of see um, the beyond the range ones here and then seven within the range. This resulted in examining 353 ground stone tools for starch. Previous studies discuss our approach for identifying Solanum jamesii starch granules from archaeological samples, and those studies developed a set of statistically defined diagnostic characteristics such as length and fissure width, which then we apply to the archaeological granules. And to measure the abundance of Solanum jamesii relative to other species granules, relative abundance was calculated using this formula. And ubiquity describes the occurrence of Solanum jamesii starch based on the number of ground stone tools from which that resource is recovered. So higher percentages indicate more pervasive use, thus having implications for the stability of the resource as well as cultural importance. So the results for the starch grant analysis um, shows that uh, Again, 353 ground stone tools were analyzed for starch. All those tools yielded more than 6,500 granules. And then 57 of those stones bore 158 granules attributed so to Solanum jamesii. And you could just see from this table here that the sites from beyond the range, so outside of the range of the potato, uh, did not yield that many Solanum jamesii starch granules or that many tools with Solanum jamesii starch versus the sites that are within the range. Four sites show consistent and ubiquitous use through time and across space. And except for sudden shelter, all of these, that includes North Creek Shelter, Mesa Verde, and uh, Chaco Canyon, all of these occur in the current range and have an archaeological potato population growing in association with the site. So all these sites with a little tuber next to it just shows that there's a lot of potato starch on those tools. And then the, the sites with a little leaf next to it indicates that there's a, a population growing today next to that site.
So for genetics, we performed analyses of genetic variation on populations of Salanum jamesii to detect the signs of tuber transport by ancient people across the four corners. Of the 169 populations, we sampled 25 for genetic analyses, and, and we did this with uh, stratified random sampling in these th three latitudinal tiers. And that's what this image is showing over here. We've got the northern tier, the middle tier, and the southern tier. We collected leaf samples from 28 to 32 individuals per population. We sequenced 681 plants and used bioinformatic programs to examine the genetic composition and the relationships among populations. The survey populations ranged in size from 40 to over 10,000 individuals with no geographic pattern. So that just means um, whether it's in the center of its distribution, it could have been a small population, whether it's outside of um, the center of distribution, it could have been a large population. So no geographic pattern there. But we did find that the northern tier of the, where the potato grows were often associated with archaeological sites, whereas the middle tier populations were sometimes associated with archaeology, and the southern tier populations were rarely associated with archaeology. We also looked at a uh, unique, we found unique phenotypic characteristics in some of the populations when grown in a common environment or in a greenhouse. For example, the blue tubers of Mesa Verde, and here you see different leaf shape and sizes from different populations at Mesa Verde, Bears Ears, Newspaper Rock. We also found um, that the archaeological populations could not reproduce sexually unless it was mated with non-archaeological populations. And this is something we published a few years ago. And so this led to our conclusion that there was this founder effect based on um, potato sex. <laughs> um, so the hypothesis was that gathering and transporting tubers would transmit a fraction of the source population's genetic diversity, thereby creating a founder effect or a bottleneck in archeological populations. That means that not all genes required for successful sex, which would be producing seeds, would be found in archeological populations. So this is just showing that um, when you get, so the two images on the left um, over here, you, if they're growing from vegetative growth, which is cloning, which means they're just reproducing with the tubers, um, you're, those plants are not going to be able to sexually reproduce. Um, they do not produce any seeds. Whereas if you have a, a completely separate, different plant from a different population, and then it can um, reproduce sexually with another plant, so outcrossing. So we explore, uh, we uh, did some experiments in the greenhouse on um, breeding. And basically what we did was we used a tuning fork which would mimic um, bumblebee foraging behaviors. Um, so the vibration of the tuning fork, I guess re it releases um, pollen. And, um, and so we would do our own crossing experiments. Um, we would, um, well, I'll tell you in just a moment, but I'll just say that the genetically distinct individuals would produce the fruit with viable seeds when crossed. So th what this map is showing is all the different crossings we did. Um, so if it's A, X, A, that means it's an archeological population crossed with another archeological population. Um, and that would be self. Uh, and then if it's an archeological cross with a non-archeological, um, that would be, be between populations. Um, and then if it was non-archaeological with non-archaeological, it'd be within the population. So we did a bunch of different crossings. Basically, that's what this map is showing you. A lot of different crossings um, in order to detect founder effect in the archaeological populations. So we um, 
these are the different populations that we um, did these crossings with. Again, uh, six archaeological, six non-archaeological. Um, we did a total of 55 plants and 526 crosses between the different flowers. And we had um, some of our students here at University of Utah help with these experiments as well, because it's, it takes a lot of time to, to do that many crosses. And this is kind of what it looked like when, when we do those crosses, we would um, cover them in a mesh bag just to protect them. And what we found is that only archeological cross with non-archeological would make fruit fruits and seeds. And you can see here, uh, just by these numbers down here, that the probabilities of producing fruits and seeds are highest when it's a non-archeological plant crossed with an archeological plant. Um, and when we look at several different herbarium specimens, we looked at close to 500 herbarium specimens of Solanum jamesii from different herbaria across the Four Corners region. Um, none of those collected in that northern tier, which is in that green area, had fruits observed on their herbarium specimens. Whereas the ones that were collected down kind of in the center of its distribution have fruits. So this led us to the question of whether the archeological populations, especially those in that Northern tier were of anthropogenic origin. So here's some results from our genetic analyses. Uh, these, this table shows the archaeological populations on the left. We had 11, and then, um, I mean, four, we had 14 archaeological populations and then um, 11 non-archaeological populations. These different columns show the degree of polymorphism, the number of unique alleles, and heterozygosity. And by these standard measurements, the archaeological populations have lower genetic diversity than non-archaeological populations. And this becomes significant when instead of comparing the numbers of populations, you compare the numbers of individuals. So you're increasing the sample size from 11 archaeological to now 407. So it becomes significant when we compare the individual plants. And therefore, we believe that these are symptoms of founder effects in more recently established populations. To determine the relationships among populations, we conducted principal components analysis. And what you see here are really tight clusters, very well separated. Three clusters are exclusively archeological. So cluster one, two, and three are all archeological. And the last cluster, cluster four, um, contains essentially all the other archeological and non-archeological populations. Now, with respect to Southern Utah, um, Escalante area, um, cluster one has two populations, Oak, Clone, and North Creek Shelter. And cluster two um, has uh, two pop also two populations from Escalante, um, and those are Fertig and Escalante Gorge, but those are more closely related with populations in Bears Ears. So again, these are really astounding differences where the geography doesn't explain these patterns. So to illustrate this a little bit better, because I know this um, PCA isn't the best way <laughs> to describe it. So I'm gonna try to describe it in a better way. Um, so here's those two populations in cluster one that I mentioned. This is um, down in Escalante. And so here's North Creek Shelter and Oak Clone. They're only five kilometers apart and they're more than 95% genetically similar. Two more populations, which are equally distant, five kilometers apart, there's Fertig and Escalante Gorge, four kilometers away. Uh, those are more similar to populations 178 kilometers away and all the way across the Colorado River in the Bears Ears National Monument. 
So this suggests that they have separate origins. And to look at these origins, we conducted structure analysis. Structure analysis reveals composition by ancestry. Each of these bars down here represents the composition by ancestry. In other words, where the genes come from. And each bar is a pop individual population, or I mean, each bar is a population that shows that ancestry composition. So in cluster one, you have its origins. Um, cluster N again is uh, North Creek and Oak Clone. It has its origins in the Mogiam Rim or region, and they share genes with uh, Chaco Canyon. And that's the blue that you see there. Cluster two, we're not quite sure where the origin is. We might not have sampled enough populations to, to get at that. But um, what we do see is that two populations in Escalante, again, share uh, ancestry with Bears Ears populations, which look like also share some populations with El Moro down in New Mexico and all the way down in Southern New Mexico as well. Cluster three, which includes Mesa Verde, Chimney Rock, and El Moro, these, those seem to have their origins in Southern New Mexico and in Northern Texas. And then, oops, excuse me, cluster four, the yellow, um, we're just assuming that's the Mogium natural populations. Um, and you could kind of see that it looks like it's been moving from East to West. So this tells us that there's multiple transport events through time. So our, our hypothesis stands that Slanum jamesii tubers were used and transported across the range. The genetics establishes that at, at least some archeological populations are anthropogenic especially those in the northern tier of the documented range, and that the anthropogenic range is clearly separate from its natural range. In terms of manipulation, the search is on for gene loci and phenotypic traits of domestication, including freezing tolerance, mother tuber resilience, and glycoalkaloid concentration. So stay tuned, there's more to do on this project. And thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Lauderback. We appreciate that. Before you remove your slides, um, we had some questions right at the beginning about kind of the locations of, of the tubers. And um, if you could go back to maybe one of your beginning slides, I think people wanted to see um, their distribution. I'll go to the big map. Here we okay. go. Yeah, I think this is the one they were they were looking at. So the white circles are the the range of 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 the plants. Each so. each dot is a documented potato population. Now on this one, we haven't indicated which ones are are, are associated with archaeology or not. Um, we have another map that does that later on, if, if you want me to move down to that one. But this is the 169 uh, documented populations that um, our team, uh, I mean, our, the, one of our colleagues, uh, John Bamberg, who's the director of the Potato Gene Bank, works for the um, Department of Agriculture. I mean, they've been documenting the species for over 30 years. So they have the most extensive database. And then our project has added to that database. Um, so uh, this is all the documented populations that are known. Okay. And so this is the, the, the plant itself, as well as the ones that are associated with archaeological sites. And then do you want to show the map of the, the ones that where it differentiates? Yeah, now this is a little small, but and I don't know if you can see my cursor or not. I was kind of using it, but um, the filled in circles, um, those are populations associated with archaeology. Okay. These stars are all the archaeological sites that we examine 
groundstone tools for starch. Okay. And then the 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 non filled in ones are just the um the just the plants themselves again. That's right. Okay. So stars are the archaeological sites you examined groundstone at, and then the filled in circles are the um, populations that are associated with sites. That's right. Okay. Perfect. So I think that hopefully clarifies some of the beginning questions for, for folks. So thank you for going back through that. Uh, all right. So what will us, and, and, and for those of you who are new to our cafe, um, if you have questions for Dr. Lauterbach, put them in the Q and A box. Uh, the chat is disabled. So we will go through and, 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 and try to get to all of your guys' questions. So Thank you so much for being patient with us. Um, so uh, I have a question about the research and how far you examined into Texas. People were wondering if you look, they, they saw, they see it on the map and they wondered how far you looked into that area. In terms of... Um... I'm guessing yeah. they're asking about seeing as there are some plants that are the the plants themselves and then some associated with archaeological sites that are kind of on the boundary of New Mexico. I think they're asking if you went further than that, looking at Texas, if that the plants and archaeological sites. So, yeah, and let's see. So number, so 14 is um, Dog Canyon. Uh, 22 is, oh, I can't read that. <laughs> I don't have my reading glasses. And then 25 Mary. is Mary, yeah. Uh, and 25, it looks like Dave, Davis. Or, yeah. I can't remember the name of all of these populations. And Dog Canyon was um, associated with an archaeological site. So we included them in our genetic analyses. I did not look at any ground zone tools from that site. I don't think there were any, to tell you the truth. Uh -huh. um, so we just included them in the genetic analyses. Got it. Thank you. Uh, we have a question about the starch granules, and they are asking um, how they would have survived hundreds of years um, in the archaeological record. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and so starch granules are uh, basically have like a crystalline kind of structure, um, and it's made up of um, cellular layers that are very, um, I'm not going to say indestructible, but they're very um, resistant against um, kind of the outside elements. Um, and so if it's kind of also like pollen grains that have these walls that protect them over hundreds of thousands of years in some cases. Um, they found starch on Neanderthal teeth. Um, so they can preserve. And the other thing is when they're, um, if you imagine people in the past grinding, I mean, we do this today in our kitchens, grinding plant foods and a mortar and pestle kind of thing. But imagine doing this on a, a raw material like sandstone where it's really porous. All of those plant residues are gonna get embedded into those cracks and crevices. And those cracks and crevices um, act as, as its own little kind of preservation, you know, little nugget. <laughs> so, um, so they're not always exposed to the outside elements, um, but they're they're just they're um, chemically resistant most of the time. Um, they and they just have this um, structure that allows them to persist for a, a very long time. Interesting. But having said. At all that, I will say that there's still a lot to do with taphonomy of starch, meaning how did it get into the archaeological record from the plant to the archaeological record? A there still is a lot of work going into that. So starch granule analysis is a really valuable tool, um, but it's still underdeveloped. But when you combine it with other analyses like genetics and mating experiments and um, other other kinds of analyses like that, then um, it can become very powerful. 
Yes. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that these potatoes would be higher in calories and sugar, and we have a question asking when, about if that would, wouldn't that be advantageous in, in times of food scarcity? Yes, absolutely. That's why, you know, even though we list it as a negative attribute, um, I believe that in the past it, it would have been good to have more calories and maybe more sugars as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so someone is asking about radiocarbon dates of the sites with the with the James E. I. Um, plants. What um, could you speak to that a bit? Um, so these were all um, tools from museum collections. Um, we made sure to um, get tools that were from deposits that were dated already. And these range in time. So North Creek Shelter is probably the oldest, around 11,000 years ago. And then we have um, artifacts that date to as early as, you know, 1,000 or 500 years ago. So we're, we're really spanning the entire Holocene here. Um, so we did try to 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 get that whole time range um, and also to get it across the region as well. So the groundstone tools weren't dated themselves. The, they came from deposits that were dated from some other um, some other way, like charcoal or something like that. Yeah. Um, since we're on the topic of the groundstone, um, I have a question about uh, about if they if you find potato starches in in the pots that they were using or pottery, um, like if they were boiling the potatoes or, or things like that, and not just on the manos and matates. I would love to get into that. Um, I just don't know if you know, and I think some experimental work needs to be done. Um, but if in the past and even today. Um, if indigenous people were uh, boiling the potatoes, would that leave us, uh, you know, evidence of starch residue, like as if you were grinding it? Um, the other thing is when when starch is cooked, uh, it sometimes can completely lose its form. Um, you can still tell if it's starch by dyeing it because starch will. Uh, um, will react with um, uh, potassium iodine. Uh, so that's one way to tell if you have cooked starch. So that would be one experiment I would wanna do on like ceramic vessels. Um, so you could still extract plant residues from ceramic vessels, but I have a feeling you're not going to get as many intact starch granules as if you were looking at ground stone tools when people were purposely grinding, you know, tubers or other plant parts on the stone and thereby releasing the granules into the stone itself. I think it's different with ceramics. They we're probably cooking them versus um, uh, grinding them. So you would get a different signal of starch. Um, and the other thing is when it is cooked starch, a lot of those diagnostic characteristics that you see on starch granules that help you identify what plant was being processed probably would not be there because again, it loses its form, it kind of gelatinizes. But I would love to uh, try that. I have not looked at starch from ceramics yet. Okay, well, that's good to, good to know. Future work yeah. is, is uh, imminent <laughs> yes. Yes. and possible. So. Oh yeah, lots. Uh, Let's see here. We've got a lot of questions. So I am trying to, I have a few questions about um, people wanting to know about the range of these plants into Mexico. Um, could you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, there there is a couple documented in Mexico. Um, we don't know if those because Solanum cardiophyllum, which d grows in in Mexico, which is um, very common in Mexico, we don't know if 
because uh, that one specimen that was identified in Mexico is an herbarium specimen. So we don't know if it was misidentified or not. Um, and beyond that one specimen, I don't think there's mo there's any other evidence that it grows down there. It really is confined to the Four Corners region. Um, but that's not to say that maybe that population sometime maybe in the past has extended down into Mexico. And they uh, there could have also been a lot of interbreeding and hybridization between Cardiophyllum and James E.I. Our colleagues, um, our co-authors, John Bamberg, uh, has been doing crosses with Cardiophyllum for years. And um, it actually, you can cross Selenium Cardiophyllum with Selenium James E.I. and you can get much bigger tubers that way because Cardiophyllum has bigger tubers naturally than James E.I. does. And that's the whole thing with, with the U with the USDA is why they're very interested in the species is because they're they're trying to see if it's it could be another food source for our growing population um, so that we don't just rely on Solanum tuberosum. Um, because what we don't want to have happen again is like the Irish potato phantom famine. So it would introduce kind of a new potato species. Um, so they've been doing crosses for for years on this. And, and so that, that does lead to someone else's question. So do, does that mean that, um, have they been successful with interbreeding or, you know, using these potatoes and, and interbreeding them with other varieties? Yeah, the main one I know about is the Selenum cardophyllum. And yes, okay. very, very successful. Um, I think there's probably been some other trials. I just don't know about them as well. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, we have a question about the persistence of the anthropogenic populations. And then they were asking about temporal limits and uh, the odds of the anthropogenic populations having died out over time. Okay. So the question is about they're asking about the temporal limits of the persistence, the temporal limits okay. on the persistence of the anthropogenic population. Okay. Okay. So I, that's a really good question. Um, so the fact that we found starch on monozymatates from North Creek shelter from deposits as old as 11,000 years ago suggests that the population that grows there today could have been transported that long ago. Um, and one thing I didn't mention when I was talking about Escalante is that Escalante Valley used to be called Potato Valley because of this potato. It's long since been forgotten. And even the uh, people that live there kind of lost that connection to it. Um, and so that's a big part of our outreach is reconnecting the communities, including indigenous communities with the potato. Um, so that's an example of a really old population. Um, that's not to say that maybe that wasn't the population that was brought there. And maybe there wasn't a garden there. You know, I, I don't really know. It, we're not able to say, you know, when these populations got there. All we were trying to do is see if there's any evidence that people transported them sometime during the Holocene. Um, so there's other populations like the ones in Chaco Canyon. I'm presuming that those came when um, the place really kind of became occupied and really grew. And when they were growing a lot of corn, they were maybe growing potatoes with the corn. Um, so uh, I think it came at different times in different places, maybe starting as early as 11,000 years ago, maybe even before um, and persisting throughout time. And I mean, the fact that those populations are still growing next to these archeological sites just shows you how persistent these populations are. And if it weren't for the indigenous 
the people who were managing and stewarding these potato populations over the centuries and millennia, they wouldn't exist. So it's a fascinating species because it has this ability to persist. I mean, that's another piece of research I didn't really get into is that our co-author, John Bamberg, has found that the potato tuber itself can persist, the mother tuber can persist underground for 16 years and never produce any shoot. So they are, they have their own adaptation to climate change and, um, and it's just um, fascinating to me uh, how the, these, this species can, you know, can prolong itself. Yeah, that's amazing. I'm, yeah. I'm astounded by that. That's <laughs> hard to wrap your brain around. Um, people are, there's a lot of questions about, about the way they taste and, and, um, could you talk about, um, what they taste like and, and how you would prepare them for, for it, for it to be very. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I think they're delicious. They really do have a nutty earthy flavor. Um, and part, I think part of that reason is because you don't skin it. You keep the skin on um, because they're so small. And um, the way we prepare it is we just cut them in half and then we saute it in a pan with butter, salt, and pepper. And it's great as a side. Um, we've seen other people prepare them differently. We had one um, friend. She's the chef at the Twin Rocks um, Trading Post down in Bluff. She prepared them in a salad and that was also delicious. Um, so, uh, and we've seen it used as a garnish with trout, um, a lot of different, there's a lot of different ways I think you can prepare it. Um, and, uh, but yeah, it's, it's really delicious. Every once in a while, like at each indigenous dinner we've been at, maybe one person would come up to us and say, oh, we had a bitter potato. <laughs> so there might be, you know, like one tuber that's a little bitter, um, but that happens in store-bought potatoes too, so. Yeah, 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 you get that in all in all kinds. So yeah. that's interesting um, that you said that they taste kind of like nuts. Someone kind of speculated in the question if that, that might be the case, so. Um, that's really interesting. Yeah, and we also um, put them in soups. It, yeah. They're perfect spoon size on soups. Yeah, um, that's a so, great idea. Yeah. Uh, how exciting to have tried them in so many different in so many oh, yeah. different ways. <laughs> yeah. And I take it your son is a fan, seeing as you introduced that he his nickname at the beginning. Yes. Oh yeah, <laughs> he has sat through many of our food trials so <laughs> <laughs> I love it um all right let's see what other questions have we not answered yet um you mentioned in one of um your other answers about um about doing work with tribes and, and and collaborating with tribes to to, to reintroduce them uh, but have you found evidence of any people, tribes, communities um, that are growing them today? And and you and yeah, uh, they certainly are. Um, yes, and this is one part of the project that I didn't get into. Um, but this, the NSF funded collaboration, has led to four other funded, out externally funded projects. Um, two of them led by Bruce Pavlik, and two of them led by Cynthia Wilson. Um, the two, uh, well, let's see here. So one was um, funded by the USDA that Bruce Pavlik ran. And we basically ran workshops with um, the first year, seven indigenous farmers. And we basically had a sharing of knowledge. So it was Bruce and, um, and me and a couple others kind of uh, telling, you know, how this is how we grow it. And this is what we think about this potato. And then the indigenous farmers doing the same thing. This is how, this is how we, what we know about it. 
this is how we grow it. These are our traditional practices. And it was very interesting who we learned from each other. Um, and even I learned, um, you know, some of the knowledge that they were willing to share has actually kind of, you know, um, reshapened the way I think about the potatoes. So one of one of the lady farmers that we spoke with mentioned that, well, maybe those populations next to ar archaeological sites weren't actually gardens. They could have been, you know, little um, like caches of tubers for when um, they would do their long walks, uh, they would cache food in certain places along the way. So I had never thought about that in, in that way before. So their knowledge has certainly um, informed the way we think about it from a Western science standpoint. Um, and then I think the way we grow it um, has also helped them grow it in their, their farms and gardens today. Um, another interesting story with that is um, one of the um, Puebloan farmers that we worked with, he was taking over his grandfather's farm. And so he wanted some of these potatoes to plant among the corn that they were growing. Well, when he started digging up, all of a sudden he had all these tubers. <laughs> so he had no idea that his grandfather had planted tubers already. And so it was just kind of a full circle moment there. Um, so, and then another part of our outreach was um, uh, working with um, teachers and students at Monument Valley High School. Um, they have a great agricultural program there. And we helped install um, uh, gardens. And so like uh, garden beds and greenhouses. We did that at four different locations and, um, and provided them with irrigation and everything. It's very hard to grow potatoes in Monument Valley just because of um, the heat, uh, the lack of water and, and the wind actually, which was the worst part is the wind. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, that, that was another um, outreach project. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, it'll continue. So we still work with Cynthia, we're quite close with her still. And so, yeah. I had a few questions, which is kind of kind of jumping back into it a bit, but I have a question about, um, I'm just going to read it directly, but do you have any pre preliminary results slash impressions reg regarding the alkaloid content of the potatoes? Yeah, we have preliminary uh, data uh, that suggests that the archaeological populations have lower glycoalkaloid content than the non-archaeological populations. We're still working on those analyses though. So, um, but that's what the preliminary data show so far. Um, and that would be really interesting to, if that really, um, if that was a real robust result, that would then suggest that perhaps people were purposely choosing populations that were not bitter um, and using those to, you know, go, go other places with. Um, but again, that's one of those, um, manipulation markers that we're still looking into. Yeah. And there'll be more out of, about that. Are you planning to start betting off them? That'll be, yes. we will be sure to keep our eyes peeled and, and make sure we share that with our, with our audience and probably in our PAT, um, email. So when that comes out, we'll, we'll be sure to share that with everyone. Um, People, there's a few questions now about um, access, getting access to the seeds or getting trying the potatoes. Is there a way that people can do that? Yeah, so what we um, all agreed on is to let uh, the indigenous uh, farmers and indigenous people, um, you know, have first dibs on it. And um, we see this as their um, heritage um, and how they want to use it, distribute it, um, sell it, market it, whatever they want to do, um, they should get first dibs. Um, so it, I think that's kind of been a slow um, 
going in that sense. I don't think, I think some people like the idea of commodifying it, you know, because I, they have to make a living. Um, I think some other people don't like the idea of commodifying it. They see it as sacred and they want to protect the locations of, of the potato populations. So I, you know, I think, I don't know, there's a lot, there's a lot there. So we have not commercialized it or anything like that. We don't really see that as our, our, our role. Um, one thing that I think would, might interest the tribes is to maybe patent it in some way, you know, uh, because I have a feeling this, this um, traditional food movement or this, what is it called? Slow food movement or local food movement. It's really becoming a thing now. And I just have a feeling that somebody's going to take that potato and go off with it. So I hope it's uh, a member of our indigenous community that will do that. Yeah. And that makes sense that you don't see that as, as your role. So thank you. Um, there are people, um, let's see, what else do, what else could we, um, yeah, lots of the, how to get their hands on these. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, uh, this is a good question. Um, do, do you think that the potatoes would have been a large or a small part of, of people in the past diet? Would they have been using these every day or, or more occasionally? That's a good question. I don't really know. Um, you know, it's hard to, as an archaeologist, it's hard to get at, you know, how dominant one food was over another because typically the evidence we're relying on is, is not a lot, right? It's um, basically the remains that are left there after people leave. So, um, and with especially a lot of plant foods, um, they just don't preserve as well as bones and stones, right? So always bones from animals look like they're the, the more dominant part of the diet, just because bones preserve better. Um, I've never been able to find a, a tuber in an archaeological site. I know that that's possible, um, but from my work, I haven't, so I have to rely on plant residue, which is always going to be um, harder to get at um, and harder to track abundance or important stuff in the diet. The measures that I provided, the ubiquity and abundance, I really tried to get at that. I will say that um, the Pueblo Bonito, oh yeah, this right here, the half of the stone tools that we looked at had potato starch, which was unbelievable to me. We had, we looked at 53 stone tools. That tells me that there, I would say there, it was probably pretty important. Um, and, um, we also found corn maize starch on some of those as well. So obviously corn was important too, but the fact that it was occurring that frequently on, on the tools, um, it tells me, and again, you can't really get at, uh, that kind of conclusion unless you have, with starch grain analysis, all about numbers, number of uh, artifacts you're looking at and number of starch granules you're retrieving. And if you don't, if you don't have a big number of both, then you're not going to be able to say much. So with this grant, we were able to really look at a lot. And even with all of that, we still can't say all that much. <laughs> but at least we could say something, you know. So yeah. Could um could the cultivation or how quickly new tubers you know, come about or, or the productiveness of tubers, could that speak to that question a little bit? And and do you have any answers on how, how productive they are? Oh, they're incredibly prolific. I mean, when we grow them in a greenhouse, we just take one tuber, the mother tuber of a plant, put it in another pot. And within one growing season, which is about six months, 
it can produce up to um, 600 more tubers. Wow. So it's incredibly prolific. Um, uh, and But they're small, you know, so they might be kind of hard to harvest. But that was the other thing we worked on with the indigenous farmers is how's the, what's the best way to harvest? And we actually came up with this really cool thing called a tuber tower, <laughs> which is basically just stick a wheelbarrow under this hanging tuber tower and then you release a like a plate underneath and the tubers will just fall because it's just too hard. If you put it in a garden bed, it's too hard to harvest all the tubers because they, they grow on these stolons, which can go out for a meter long. So if you don't know exactly where your patch is, then it could be very hard to harvest these tubers. Hmm. Um, so yeah, they're incredibly prolific. And if, um, if someone in the past or even someone today just planted them in their garden, you, know, you will see that it will soon take over yeah. because that mother tuber will send its baby tubers out and they will just go in every direction and take over your garden. Wow. So, yeah. That's really interesting. That's really interesting. Yeah. Awesome. Well, it's, it's about seven o'clock, so I want to respect everyone's time and, 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 and we apologize if we didn't get to your questions, we will, um, we will try to, um, send them over to Dr. Ladderback and if, if there's time, we can try to get to them at another time. So we really appreciate everyone's attendance tonight and, and thank you, Dr. Ladderback. This has been so informative and, and so great. And, um, thank you to all that have been here tonight and, Everyone, also next month, December 5th, we are having our uh, third cafe called More Than Subsistence, how the Anishinaabe traditional foodways nourish culture, kinship, community, and well-being um, by Ashley Thompson. And this talk will be a live event and an online event. So it'll both be online and at the Loft Cinema here in Tucson. So if you are in Tucson, please please try to come to the, the loft and, and see us in person again after a long, um, a long period away. And, and to all those who can't make it, it will still be on Zoom. So um, uh, go ahead and register for that like you did for this one. And thank you, Dr. Ladderback. We really appreciate it. And um, I hope everyone has a great evening and, 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 and we will see you at the next one. Thank you. Thank you.